The three parts of witnessing. Faith. Have you ever been asked when you've been outside your door and the Lord opens up a door or something like that and, or something? Have you ever been asked, why are you doing this? Why, why are you doing this? Why are you going around uh, uh, cars and putting tracks in the windshields? Uh, by the way, this is from uh, Fellowship Track League. Uh, these, uh, this is one of my favorite ones that I use. Um, Fellowship Track League. The link is for the, uh, on the channel here. But uh, anyway, uh, why, why are you doing this? You ever been asked that? Why? 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 Why are you out there putting tracks on cars? Why are you? Why are you talking to me about this? Why? What? What's in it for you? What's in it for you? Right? And can you blame people for asking that of you, brother, sister? Huh? Think of it this way: here in America, at least, you got the J hoes who go door to door, and not so much anymore with the psychological operation known as the poison ground, but um, the, the j -hos. And they do what they do because they are working to save themselves. Same with the morons, the Mormons, okay? They do what they do because it's a workspace salvation, okay? Workspace salvation, all right? Both of them lost. Both of them heretics, okay? But the more the moron is out there doing it for the same reason, to save themselves. But then again, you get these Christians, right? These Christians that set up their little prayer stations and not praying with anyone, mind you. Not praying with anyone, mind you. But all kinds of literature, and you know, God loves you kind of tripe and whatnot. But... Why are they doing it? Ultimately, to, to get a little pat on the head by the pastor, or pastoress like we talked about, but ultimately to bring people to their church building, to get them churched. So when, like the Jehos, the morons, and these Christians from the buildings, they have their outreach things, why are they doing it? Because of some kind of carnal thing. Because the world revolves around them. They're doing it because it makes them feel good. Because it's something that makes them look good. I brought five people to church the other day. How many did you bring? I'm out there knocking on doors. Saving souls. I know, uh, uh, His Holiness from Maine, he, he showed an excerpt once about Steve Anderson and stuff like that and how they talk exactly like that, okay? It's all, it's all carnal. It's all to glorify themselves because the world revolves around themselves. So their witnessing is, uh, while, while some may indeed speak the truth, it's carnal, it's self-serving. Not Christ-centered. But see, you and I, you and I as the Church of the Living God, what makes us different from the Jehos? What makes us different from the morons? Well, lots of things, obviously. But I mean, out there in the witnessing, because I can't tell you, this doesn't happen that much anymore, but I can't tell you how many times people have asked me, are you a Jehovah's Witness? No. No. Are you a Mormon? <laughs> God forbid, no, no. Like I said, that doesn't happen too much anymore, but uh, that that has happened, you know. You yeah, you, it's like here. Can I can I offer you a gospel tract? You a Jehovah's Witness? And uh, what I have taken to do, uh, I haven't been asked that, like I said, in a while. But what I have taken to do is do this: <laughs> spit right in front of them, right on the ground. It's like, no, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. That gets the point across right away. And it stops. But then again, I've encountered. What, what, what church are you with? Uh, no church. Except the church of the living God. 
what denomination is that? It's not a denomination. That's what we called ourselves. Uh, the world, you, you yourself, inaccurately referred to us as Christians. We called ourselves the Church of the Living God. It's not a denomination. It's uh, what we are, saints of the Lord. Okay? Why are we doing it? Why are we doing it? To bring them to a church building? God forbid, no. But why are we doing it? Get your authorized version of the scriptures. The King James Version, commonly called. Follow me along in the scriptures, word for word. Verse by verse at the scriptures we are going to be looking at today. Follow me along. Check me out. But I'm not skipping a groove. Sometimes I, I read a little too fast. Okay? The mouth goes a little bit quicker than the brain does sometimes. You know what I mean? And I might skip a groove. So keep me accountable. Okay? Check me out. Make sure I'm not lying to you. But why are we doing it? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be touching on 2 Corinthians chapter 5 here, obviously, because it cannot be avoided when talking about this. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 on to verse 16. For the love of Christ constraineth us. The love of Christ. And see, Christianity tells you this love is a love that doesn't judge, a love that isn't angry, a love that has no requirements. That's a fairy tale. That's a fable. Okay? True love is to speak the truth of Christ unto the lost. My deadliest enemies who have made their choice in going to hell already, too bad for them. But those who are our enemies, how do we show them? For the love of Christ constraineth us. How do we show them love? You're going to hell. You need to be broken of your self-righteousness. You need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ on His terms, not your own. If you don't, you don't come to him his way, but you want to be a thief and a robber and boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way. You're going to go to hell. You can't save yourself. You're not a good person. Okay? It is your fault. You got. You better be afraid of him. And see, unless you come to him on his terms, you're going straight to hell, boy doesn't matter what you can do, what you have done, your excuses that are a mile long. It don't matter. It don't matter. Unless you come to him on his terms. Look at me. Unless you come to him on his terms, you're, you're going to hell. Doesn't matter if whether or not you think you're a good person. Doesn't matter. You're not good. And that's true love. You read the scriptures, dear friend. The Jesus Christ of the authorized version, the true scriptures, was very confronting. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Father, our God, had this nasty habit of taking his finger and putting it right on that problem. See, and that's the thing. That's the love of Christ. See, the love that is given to you in the church buildings, dear friends, is a love that doesn't judge. It's a love that has no requirements. A love that, is, it's fake. It's fake. A love that would rather make you feel good rather than giving you what you need, your feelings of what they have in mind. Not your soul, but your feelings. It's not love. It's not love, man. That's hate. That's hate. You want to you wanna show love to someone? Unless you come to the Lord Jesus Christ on his terms, broken of your self-righteousness, it's your fault. You better be afraid of him and cry out to him for his mercy. If you don't come to him on his terms like that, 
You're going straight to hell. Your church building and your, your little Christian friends, they can't help you. They ain't going to save you. Okay? You go knocking on doors, preaching that man of sin, the son of perdition, trying to get people to a building. They ain't going to save you, boy. And see, that's love. That's love. You need to repent of yourself. That's the hard part. See, you don't go around saying you got to repent of your sins. you got to stop what you're doing. No, you can't do that even if you had a gun pointed to your head. No, that's not the repentance. That's not the repentance. That's the beginnings of lordship salvation. Okay? As they call it, lordship salvation. Okay? The repentance is repenting of yourself. That's what it is. And see, that's not the repentance that the church buildings preach. Most of the church building uh, Christians that I, I have encountered are easy believism. Uh, I, you know, and it's very frustrating and it's very challenging because uh, it's, sometimes it's at the point where I want to lash out at some of these people. And I don't, but I do. <laughs> okay, It's like, well, repentance is going from unbelief to belief. <laughs> Oh, shut up! Okay? Oh. But see, you're telling them the truth. And you, you don't be a jerk about it. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, granted, there are people out there who are just jerks up, uh, up front. And you're like the little boy from Indiana or Indianapolis or whatever. That little boy, he's a jerk. Okay? But, you know, you don't be a jerk about it. You just telling lost people the truth of Scripture, either giving them a tract or the Lord opens a door where you can get the Scriptures out and speak to them. You just speaking the Word of God onto people. That's going to be hard enough for them to take. You don't have to add a little flair to it by you turning up a dial to put on a show for somebody. Okay? That's love. The love that Christianity is offering you is not true love. It's hate. See, we have the church of the living God. We're you're going to go fall. You know, you're running. You're going to go oh, and fall right off of a cliff. We, the church of the living God. So, uh, hey, 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 dude, dude. Wait, 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 wait. Stop going that way. C come here, let's talk. Okay, you got, you got to turn this way and go the other way because you're going... No, Okay, but no, no, a lot of, a lot of people's like, I don't want to hear what you have to say. But then along comes the Christian. Keep running. It's okay. Yeah, you got a little stumble in here and there, but don't worry. Keep running. God's happy with you anyway. It's all good. Just believe everything's going to work out for you. You know, just believe you're okay. Keep running. He's going to fall right off that cliff. Keep running. Keep running. That's hate. That's hate. Why do we do it? For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge. Oh, we are to judge. Oh, I get the one video that the Lord had me to do, okay? Um, about Mark the Mess. I finally turned off the comments. I did. I, I, I did. I turned the comments off. So many people were just ignorantly putting, don't judge, don't judge. It's like, you're not even watching the video. You haven't even made it 30 minutes into that video and you're, don't judge, don't judge. I'm telling you, every single time someone says, don't judge, it's to cover up their sin or to justify sin, whatever. Okay? But I did. I finally told you, it's like, I, I, I can't, uh, enough of it. We are to judge. Yes, it begins with us. We judge ourselves first. How? Through the scriptures. Okay, I used to be a sodomite. I am no longer a sodomite. The Lord re rescued me from that. He saved me from hell. He saved me from myself. Okay, so because I once was a sodomite, I can go to a sodomite and say, hey, hey, 
God hates what you're doing. You need to repent of yourself and come to him broken or you're going to hell. I can go to a sodomite and say that because I am I'm no longer a sodomite. Okay? That's the judgment that's being condemned in scripture is hypocritical judgment. But we are to judge. And how do we judge? According to the scriptures, not according to our hearts. Because our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Okay? We have a standard. We have the perfect standard. The authorized version of the scriptures where we judge ourselves first. But we judge others. Through the scriptures. And lost people. Don't judge. Don't judge. Seeking to defend a heretic. Or to defend their sin. Every single time. Without exception. Without exception. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge. According to what? The scripture. That if one died for all. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Then were all dead. What does that mean? Then, what is that? Then we're all dead. What does that mean? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 1 on to verse 3. Uh, let's read on to verse 4. And you, talking to you, you, those who are saved, born again, converted, of the church of the living God, and you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. De dead. The, you know the walking dead? The predictive programming of that stupid walking dead zombie stuff? You know the zombie apocalypse? Talk People talking about zombies? Predictive programming. There are zombies walking out there. Not the undead, uh, except that, that one bloke, I mean that tongue-in-cheek from England. But, uh, uh, you know, there are walking dead out there. Not zombies with maggots coming out of them. Dead. Dead. There are walking dead. There are zombies out there today made zombified by the television, by TV, by advertising, by the Jesuit order. Okay? Whether it's inoculation... Or indoctrination. The walking dead is out there. So in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14. Because we thus judge that if one died for all. Jesus Christ. He, he died for him. Yes he did. Not everybody's going to come to him on his terms. But yes. That sacrifice that he did on the cross is there for anybody. For everybody. But not everybody's going to come to him his way. That if one died for all, then we're all dead. Dead in what? Dead in trespasses and sins. Dead in trespasses and sins. We were like that once, Church of the Living God, weren't we? Going to hell without hope and without God. Why do we do it? Let's continue in Ephesians chapter 2. We're in time past... Ye walked according to the course of this world. Dead in trespasses and sins. According to the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. The devil. Lucifer. That old serpent. The dragon. There's so many names. But one being. Okay. Satan. I've heard people. Lucifer and Satan are too. Shut up. No. No. There's one Satan. That's it, okay? And he's not omnipresent. He can't be in uh, 10 places at the same time like God can. He walks to and fro in the earth, okay? And right now, I bet you the bottom dollar, he's at the Vatican or talking to that crazy psycho Putin who might, might actually launch a nuclear missile. Oh boy, that's going to be a good one, isn't it? Yeah, but Satan is somewhere over there in Europe, Okay? He's not omnipresent. Okay? He is the prince of the power of this air of the air. He is the little G God of this world. Okay? 
Where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that spirit that now worketh in the children of anti of disobedience, excuse me, that spirit of antichrist, against and replace. That's what it means to be anti. Against it and to replace it. Okay? So that uh so according to the power according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, and that spirit is the spirit of Antichrist, or that spirit, excuse me, that spirit of Antichrist. That's from 1 John chapter 2, okay? All right? Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Children of wrath. Children of wrath. Okay? Lost people. Okay? A child of disobedience is not a saved man or woman who is disobeying the scriptures. No. A child of disobedience is someone who hears the truth of the gospel and rejects it. Uh, before you hear the, uh, the gospel, you're a child of wrath. It says so. Naturally. Naturally. You're a born sinner. Okay? Children who aren't accountable, they can't understand the gravity of what it means to be a sinner, what it means that they have sinned against God. Okay? Children. Okay? Uh, what age? Don't really know. But it differs between, of course, what the Lord will have done and the child themselves, okay? But before that child reaches what they call the age of accountability, they're, they're, they're born sinners, but they don't know. They don't know. But there comes a time when they will know. Then, then you're, like you said here, children of wrath. And it says among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, naturally, the children of wrath, even as others. But look at this verse 4. That's a big but with every pun intended. But God, in the beginning God, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved, past tense, us. Verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, he had, he, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. So, quickened, made alive. You know, a lot of people, a lot, especially the Christians, especially the Christians, love to quote what? John 3, 16. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, is probably nowadays the most known verse in Scripture, besides Jesus wept. Of course, I mean, that doesn't even count. But John, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, is probably the most well-known verse in Scripture. And because of that scoundrel devil James Hetfield, they don't even quote it right. <laughs> judge not, lest ye be judge or say, hey, hey, hey. Oh, shut up. But a lot of the Christians who have some indoctrination, for God so loved, past tense, the world, that he gave, past tense, his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay? Now, there is a place in your witnessing for this, but this is not the gospel that we preach today, okay? Because if you just throw at uh, someone, John 3, 16, where, where's the repentance? Where's the repentance? Being broken of your self-righteousness, okay? You also got to remember, too, this was before the death, burial, and resurrection. Re resurrection. There is a place within your witness and testifying unto others of our Lord Jesus Christ for John 3.16. There is a place for it. Not at the beginning. <laughs> no. 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 See, God gave. He loved and he gave. God's love, dear friend, is at Calvary. 
the cross. The cross. Why do we do what we do? Why do we say what we say? Why are we willing to have people throw sticky pop on us, to kick sand at us, to have tracks knocked out of our hands, to be put, to be arrested and brought to a police station, to be spit on, to have your family turn against you, to have everyone turn against you? Why do we do it? Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. What is life? Life is oh, and life behind the eyes, right? Yes. But Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth. And the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by him. Comprende? So, and that he died for all, that they which live, which live, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And see, the Christian comes to you with the facade that they're doing something for Christ. They're doing something for Christ. What Christ? The Christ of the scriptures? Or that man of sin, the son of perdition? It's the latter, the answer to that question, by the way. The Christians. Okay? Wherefore, henceforth, Know we no man after the flesh. What does that mean? What does that mean? Carnally. We know, of course we know people. Um, of course we know other people, right? Right. But after the flesh. Not based upon what their flesh is doing. What their flesh does. No. Why? Because we judge rightly according to scripture. Okay? This, this is just, this is what my spirit and soul are housed within, okay? You haven't seen me, the true me, yet, ever, okay? You haven't. You're just looking at the skin suit, okay? And God judges differently than we do, obviously. But see, we judge according to the perfect standard, okay? Okay? So to know, and what is that? That is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. What wisdom? What wisdom is he talking about? The fear of the Lord? No. Excellency of speech or of wisdom. What wisdom is he talking about? The wisdom of men. Fleshly wisdom. Which is earthly, sensual, devilish. Okay? After the flesh. Declaring unto you the testimony of God. Verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you. Save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So when you go now, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. After the flesh. What Paul was talking about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 2 is who is actually saved. Who is crucified with Christ? Who is dead to themselves and to the world? But see, you got the Christians. Be like the world to win the world. That, and that, you know, I got to say this. I got to say this. Some of you atheists out there, uh, you just got to get over yourself. Okay? But a lot of, some of the atheists that I have encountered, uh, they, they figured this out. They figured this out. That a lot of the Christians, 99.9% .9 of the Christians that they run into, they haven't, they're not crucified with Christ. They're acting just like they are. It's, just like the, it's like, okay, okay, just believe, but yet you're still going to act like I do and laugh at the things I do? Aren't you supposed to be different? Well, it's not, it's not necessary for your salvation. But isn't that kind of like a after effect, at least, what like the one guy said, you know? See, atheists get this. But why don't these Christians? 
Because they have a Christianity that says you can have your cake and eat it too. That's why. That's why. Okay? Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. Because, of course, he's, he's went up to heaven. Okay? He went up to heaven. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Because we have faith on the one who died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, who shed his blood on the cross to make an atonement for my sin. Okay? We have faith on him. It's finished. We have faith in what has been done. It's finished. Faith is why we do what we do. Faith is why we do what we do. And when the Lord corners you, and the Lord will give every single man, including a woman, meaning mankind, every single man on this earth will have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Well, you, to be argumentative, you might be saying, well, what about babies that die? They're, uh, they're before the age of accountability. Psh, they're going up to heaven. That's what I believe, okay? Absolutely. For the age of accountability, they don't know the difference. They don't know what it means to be a sinner or what, that they've actually sinned against the Lord. Some will argue about, you know, even a child is known by their own doings or something like that, whether it be... Uh, uh, some of uh, whether it be right or whatever, nonetheless, they're at, not at the age of accountability. Okay, okay, they're not at the age of accountability. But see, you live long enough, you're going to become accountable. You're going to know that you're a sinner. You're going to know that there's a God out there, and His name is Jesus Christ, and that you have sinned, and that you're a sinner. You might not want to believe you're a sinner. That's something totally different. But you're going to become aware of it and you're going to know it. And hence you're going to be a child of wrath. And the Lord will give, the Lord gives, more often than not, more than one opportunity. More than one opportunity. But if you reject that opportunity just one time, you're a child of disobedience. You're naturally, by nature, you're a child of wrath. Okay? You got to get over that. But you hear that gospel, the true gospel, you're a child, and reject it, you're a child of disobedience. After that, you've made a, you've made a choice. Now, whether that's a lingering choice that's going to stick with you, where your heart's going to be so hard that you go past the point that you can't come back from, we don't know yet. That, that happens with time and constant rejection. But see, the Lord needs to break you. The Lord needs to break you. And this, is, and this is the most important thing. This is what brokenness is. To be broken of your self-righteousness. Because Jesus Christ went to the cross. He died. And see, you... Yes, you. When they stretched Jesus on that wooden cross, which he had to carry himself to Golgotha, Calvary, okay? A cross that weighed anywhere between 150 to 250 pounds, something like that. It was heavy, and he had to bear it. And he couldn't carry it because he got the snot kicked out of him. Beaten, gangrenous. His, his visage, his face was so marred. They yank the beard off of them. You ever accidentally tear a tuft of hair out of your head? Oh, the blood, and then it heals, and the pimples, and it, oh, it's horrible. But they tore his beard off. They spat on him. They lashed him. They whipped him. They beat the snot out of God, our Savior. And they compelled him to carry the cross. But see, because he'd taken such a beating, they had to have, uh, what was his, uh, the guy from Cyrene, um, was it Shimon? 
I think uh, I, I get that wrong. Someone will correct me. But they had someone else to carry his cross because he couldn't. Okay? You read Isaiah chapter 53. His visage was so marred. His stripes. He was beaten within an inch of his life. Bruised. Gangrenous. Bloody. On that cross. Naked on that cross. His visage so marred. Pulling the beard out, punches and cuts. You couldn't even you couldn't even discern the form of a man on that cross. Why do you do that? To pay for your sin. But see, when they stretched out the Lord on the cross, you took a hammer in your hand. And you took a nail, which was about at least 12 inches in length, at least, okay? And you, dear friend, you took that hammer and you took that nail and you put that right in his hand and you hammered that nail in there. I did no such thing. Brad, what are you talking about? No. I'm a good person. I do good things to people. I'm not as bad as other people. Then you go to the other hand. Because he was it was nailed in both hands. Like, I never did that to the Lord. What are you talking about? It's not my fault. I was born this way. My father did this to me. I ate paint chips as a kid. It's not my fault. It's someone else's fault. And then in the feet. In the feet that were overlapped. Like I said, the, the nails were at least 12 inches in length, but probably longer, especially when it came to the feet, because they overlapped his feet and they pierced his feet. Okay? And with the feet... I want to go to a bar. I want to go to a strip club. I want to go to a Black Lives Matter rally. I want to go to a Mason's Hall or a Legionnaire's Hall. I want to go to the KKK meeting. I want to go to a movie theater. And then with all of that, the crown of thorns was put on his head. What does that signify? Oh, just what Satan told Eve in the beginning, in Genesis. I am my own God. I know what is right and what is wrong. I can judge what is good. Does that sum it up for you? Hmm? For the right hand, you think you nailed it in there because you're a good person. In the left hand, it's not your fault. In the feet, you're going to do what you're going to do. And for the head, the crown of thorns, I am my own God. Does that sum it up for you? You're the one who did that. Every time, dear friend, you say that you're a good person. Every time, dear friend, that you blame somebody else and don't take personal responsibility and accountability for what you've done. Every time you go someplace where you know in that rotten heart of yours that you ought not to be going to. And every time you're thinking that you're something special when you ain't. See, Christianity, they don't preach to you love. They preach to you hate. They're the ones that put them on the cross. You're the one who put them on the cross. Hard to swallow, isn't it? Because you're such a good person, isn't it? Yeah. But see, when the Lord 
brings you to himself. Through circumstance, through whatever, he's going to, he's got to break you. Because you can't come to the Lord thinking you're this. And this is what easy believism does. They forego brokenness. They like to skip right over it. Their favorite go-to passage is in Romans chapter 3. We talked about this earlier. Okay? But they like to skip over that. And get away from repentance, contrition, and definitely fear. Because they say repentance is a work or uh, it's going to unbelief, to believe. Uh, prayer is a work and calling is a work. The things that are required <gasps> for you to truly come to the Lord on his terms, they call a work. Who figure? Why? Because they save themselves by their own belief. And, you got to remember, dear brethren, it's easy believism mostly that we are dealing with. Either that or work salvation through Catholicism, which is the mother of all this tripe, okay? But Catholicism with their, like, you know, the J-Hos and the morons and some of the Baptists, some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the, the Methodists, are, they're, they're, they're just, they're just, <laughs> the Presbyterians, Ian Paisley. Uh, one of the ones who I really enjoy listening to, and even on to this day, a Trinitarian. He was a politician. I believe in heaven. Absolutely. But he was a Presbyterian. The Presbyterian Church. Ha! <laughs> and the Lutheran, they're Catholics. Okay? The love of Christ constraineth us. See, because those of us who are truly saved, the Lord destroyed us. The Lord destroyed who I was. I died. I died with Christ on the cross. Okay? I died to myself, to this. I put those nails in his hand. I put the nails on in the feet and I put the crown of thorns on his head. I did that. I did that. And he still died for me anyway. And he broke me. It was my fault. And because it was my fault and he did that for me and I reject that, if I, if I didn't call out to him for his mercy, being broken, realizing, accepting the truth that it was my fault, I did that to him, he's going to send me to hell. And he had every right to do so. And he has every right to do so, friend. Why do we do it? Anyone who is truly saved my, my absolute favoriteest verse in all of Scripture. Someone who is truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And some of Christianity, some people will come to that point of brokenness, but they come and they say, well, I can do better. No, you can't. No, you can't. Your righteousnesses are as filthy rags, a menstrual cloth. You can't do better. Yeah, at your best, at your best, you're altogether vanity, son, daughter. Okay? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, what ministry? The ministry of reconciliation, which all of us are a part of, who are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. As we have received mercy, we faint not. Why? Because we are guided by our Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith is on him. See, 
It's faith. Faith is the reason why we do what we do. Faith on who? Jesus Christ. And the Lord, the wind behind the sails. He is the one who guides us. Okay? And in his guiding, we take that action. But we do that all in faith. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, like so many, especially the Christians, do. But by manifestation of the truth, manifestation of the truth, walking our talk, living according to the scriptures, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now that's talking about personal witnessing right there, friend. Manifesting God within us, walking our talk daily, walking according to the scriptures out there. And we don't know how God is going to use that. Like we've talked about in the previous videos, okay? All right? We align our lives with the scriptures especially for the doctrine that is pertinent for us today within the Pauline epistles, okay? But all scripture is given by inspiration of, of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's not sinlessly perfect. A perfect heart with God, that's what that's talking about, okay? Okay? But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. But many say, well, I believe. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. <laughs> what Christ do you believe on, huh? I believe in Jesus. Which one? The one that says, don't judge anybody. Or the one's like, you got a problem. And puts his finger right on it. Like he has this habit of doing. Which one? Uh, and see that in whom the God of this world, Satan, Lucifer, hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. I am a good person. God loves you. God's not mad at you. You're good. You don't have to be too extreme. It's okay. His grace covers everything. Signifying the hammering of the nail. Do you get the point? For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Your servants, for Jesus' sake. We preach to you the death, burial, and resurrection. And not only do we preach that to you, we live that in demonstration by adhering to the scriptures. Okay? What, one also a favorite of mine. Also, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Okay? This is what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and verse 2, okay? Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And you come to the Lord on his terms. He saves you. You are sealed until the day of redemption. You have the Holy Ghost. The Lord is that spirit. You have Jesus Christ, the Father, our God, living within you. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, past tense, and gave himself for me. Past tense. And, we, and, and Paul came to him on his terms, broken, contrite, and fear of him. Call upon his name. You read the testimony of Paul on the Damascus Road. It's all there. Brokenness, contrition, and in fear of him, 
He called upon the name of the Lord. Paul was there. Oh, shut up. Paul was terrified. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Okay? I do not frustrate the grace of God. For by grace are you saved. Through faith. For if righteousness come by the law, by what you do, Mr. Mark the Mess, and all you deceived disciples of his, then Christ is dead in vain. Back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Picking up at verse 7. Uh, no, 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 no. Verse 6. For God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure, Jesus Christ, in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Brother, sister, how, why do you think when you're just standing there, not even saying anything, and that person next to you or over there is acting all weird around you? It's because you've got the Lord in you. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, dying to ourselves and dying to that. Why are you doing this? Why, why would you let that lady throw that pop at you like that? Uh, why, or why, you know, why, why would you let someone uh, smack tracks on, kick gravel at you, spit at you? Why are you willing to go to the police station? Why? Why? Because the love of Christ constraineth us. We're showing love to you by warning you of what's going to come. You're going to give an account of yourself, dear friend. It don't matter if you want to believe that or not. The fact is, it is accounted unto, unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment Either at the great white throne, where unfortunately the majority of you are going to go, or to the judgment seat of Christ, where we the saved are going to go to be judged. And our works are going to be judged for rewards, not our salvation, because we are once saved, always saved. Why do we do it? For we which live are always delivered unto death, for Jesus' sake. Think about that. Delivered unto death. To die to this. To be the turd in the punch bowl, if you will. To be the weird one. To be the one that stands out. When you got Christianity saying, be like the world to win the world. To mingle yourselves in there. No. No. The lost can see us dying to ourselves and to this world. Why are you doing this? For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. The life of Jesus, he himself giving us life. be a living testimony. So then death worketh in us, the life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Now, he's quoting Psalm 116, verse 10, to be exact. But see, oh, oh, a lot of people believe, don't they? Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But what, what do they believe in? The Mormons, the Jehos, they believe in themselves. They're saving themselves. Guys like Mark the Messenger, he's saving himself. 
Catholics, they believe in the church buildings. That's what a lot of people believe. What do they believe in? Excuse me. Flesh. Flesh. Things of this world. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen, the risen Savior, God our Father. You know, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? A lot of people believe out there. What do they believe in? What do they believe on? You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I'm a good person. It's not my fault. I'm going to do what I want to do because I am my own God. I recently saw that disgusting book. I actually had it in my hand. I was talking to uh, my brother. Uh, and uh, I had that book by that devil, Joel Osteen, The Power of I Am. That guy is such a... Joel Osteen, I believe, if we were to see what, uh, and we will see, uh, you know, we will because, you know, he's going to, when we're standing up there with the Lord, the devil himself is going to have to give an account. So we, the Church of the Living God, we are going to see what Satan looks like eventually when he's standing at the great white throne himself. Yeah! The one that everybody wants to worship himself is going to be at the great white throne. Wow, huh? Wow. The accuser of the brethren. You know, that one that stepped with all those precious stones, decked out, looks so beautiful, whose pipes, ah, sing you a lullaby, huh? Speak to you smooth things, prophesy deceits. Dragon, speak. Speak to you smoothly in a very soft voice, never over aggressive or offensive, always at the same almost monotone type of voice, speaking like a dragon, speaking unto you smooth things, prophesying to you deceits. Yeah. Yeah. So many people believe. But what do they believe on? You shall know them by their fruits. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Even atheists can figure that one out. It's like, okay, you're claiming to be saved, right? But yet, there's no difference between you and I. There's none. And I'm supposed to take that seriously. And there are some out there who forcibly change, make changes themselves. But that also comes out in the proof in the pudding also because it ends up that all the time when you run into someone like that who changes their life by their own power, it becomes a, I did this, I do this, I've done self-glorification. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you talking on to save people. But there again, every one of us is going to give an account of himself to God. It doesn't matter if you want to believe that, accept that or not, that's what's going to happen. You're watching this, dear friend. You've been warned. You've been warned. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. And look at that. For all things are for your sakes, to bring you to repentance and brokenness of yourselves, that you may be brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. You come to him on his terms. But no. What do you want to do? I don't want to. I'm a, I'm a good person. It's not my fault. I'm going to do what I want to do. I, I'm my own God. I can do Hey, that's okay. Just believe. Just believe. I mean, I don't know. You, you know, you shouldn't do that. But don't worry. His grace covers it all. Just go ahead. Because you're saved. It doesn't matter. It's not going to affect your salvation. You go to the Lord. You think you're saved by that? Uh, you don't have his salvation. So yes, for all things are for your sakes. That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. 
But though our outward man perish, <laughs> yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Who, 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 who are you proving that to? You're saved. You need to. You need to be. You need proof, huh? You're saved. You need. You need. Keep needing proof, huh? Oh, you, okay. You might be a babe. I'll give you that. But hey, you've been saved for 25 years, and you still need proof. You're not saved. You're not saved. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You know, yesterday, talking to a brother, a thing about suicide came up. A permanent solution for a temporary problem. Okay? Now, the act of suicide itself is not going to send you to hell. That's true. Someone who is saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, you decide to chomp on a bullet, you're not going to lose your salvation. It's not yours to lose. But there again, you decide to chomp on a bullet or step out in front of a train and you decide to take your life against when the Lord would have you your life to end because our days are numbered. The Lord knows when we're going to go. Okay? He does. Uh, it's the same principle as one of these saved people who take the scriptures and throw them away and live uh, like a devil. You'll be in heaven, which is better than being in hell. Absolutely. But the Lord is going to be ashamed of you for eternity. Imagine being at a big party where the guest of honor is someone that you really love, but he doesn't want anything to do with you because you, you embarrassed him throughout your whole life. But yet you're in that party, but you have no access to the head of the party while everyone else does because of your stupidity of living contrary uh, to the script, scriptures or getting engulfed by these light afflictions and decide to chomp on a bullet. It's not worth it, my friend. Oh, yeah, you'll, you'll go to heaven if you're truly saved, born again and converted, beg your pardon, of the church of the living God. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Suicide in itself will not send you to hell. No, it won't. But I'm telling you, brother, you, you decide to... <coughs> Off yourself, the Lord's going to be ashamed for you for eternity. You're going to be part, you're going to be in that big party with absolutely no access to the head of the party. Is that what you want? It's better than being in hell? You're right. But see, right there tells a lot about you. And right there, if that is your, and I, I know of quite a few of these people who do this. Who, who behave like a devil, but say, well, I, I called on the name of the Lord, just called and yet never been broken or uh, have any contrition or fear, but yet called on the name of the Lord, but yet they live like a devil. Well, I'm going to be in heaven. Uh, you, you're not. No, 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 you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> especially, especially the one I'm thinking about. But, um, you know, that says a lot about you. That says that you have not truly been crucified with Christ. So that makes you question whether or not someone is truly saved if they have that mentality. We all have weak moments. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Jeremiah had weak moments. Paul had Peter. Okay, absolutely. But someone who lives their life like that, well, I'm going to be in heaven, so I might as well. Hey, it doesn't matter. Uh, I doubt you're saved. I doubt you Yes, people who are saved, who live like the devil, there are those out there. They're going to be in heaven. But just like, just like with suicide, you take that route, God's going to be ashamed of you for eternity. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And of course, you're lost. You're lost. 
and you get upset about what's going on in the world and you decide to uh, chomp on a bullet, of course, you're going to hell. Okay? You talk about a permanent solution. You thought your life was bad here now. You're lost and you decide to chomp on a bullet, step out in front of a train, your problem's just beginning, boy. <laughs> for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, for a moment, the, the, this, this stuff pertaining to the flesh, this, this will end. See, again, eternal mindset, people. Okay? When I get to heaven, I'm not going to have this heart problem. When my wife gets to heaven, she's not going to have that fake hip and that piece of metal in her arm. When my best friend gets to heaven, he's, he's not going to have that stupid filter in him. Okay? We're not going to have those things. These light afflictions. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Right here. Excuse me. While we look not at the things which are seen, carnal, carne, fleshly, temporal, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. Why do we do it? Because we are eternally minded. You're going to give an account. The Lord who saved us can save you. And we, the love of Christ constraineth us. We witness unto you, the lost. Not to bring you to a church building. Not to make you part of a clique, like the clique here that's on YouTube. You know, the clique of the King James Bible believing Christians, led by whatever leader of that clique within itself. We're not do preaching this to you to, uh, to get our way to heaven or to stay safe, no. You're going, on, you're going for a cliff, and you're going to fall, and you're going to give an account to yourself. Of yourself to God. And see the Lord saved us. Because we came to him on his terms. And he saved us. And we want that for you. The Lord wants it for you more than we do. But it's not going to be at gunpoint. He doesn't force it on you. He does not eradicate free will. Mr. Calvinist. That's why we do it. Because faith. Faith, dear friend. Faith. Faith is why we do this. Faith on who? The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who saved us. We know what's coming. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Verses 1 under verse 6. Beg your pardon. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the capital R, Rock. Who saved us. His work is perfect. The work of salvation. We're looking at this for instruction and in righteousness, by the way. Okay? His work is perfect. The death, burial, and resurrection. To make an atonement for the sins that you committed, that he died for because of you. You put him on that cross. It's your fault. And unless he saved you, you're going to hell. Better be afraid of him. Because you're going to give an account before him. And you're either going to have your works judged and go to heaven. Or you're going to be cast off to the lake of fire. 
There's no middle ground. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. The spot of his children can be washed uh, saved by the blood of the crucified one. Okay? I like that one, by the way, that hymn. But our, the spot that we get will get wiped away, cleansed away. Their spot remains because it's not cleansed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're looking at this for instruction and in righteousness. This was under the dispensation of the law. Keep that in mind. Instruction and in righteousness. Okay? Let's continue. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are perverse and crooked generation. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Unwise, not fearing the Lord. Okay? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Now, today in this dispensation, the way the Lord buys you is if you come to him on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of him, you call upon his name and he saves you. He washes away his, your sins in his blood. You are the purchased possession. But what's new, interesting about this, hath he not made thee an established thee? Uh, you lost person, the Lord made you. You are a creation. You have life given to you of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, you have life. The light that's in your eyes, that's life. You have life. The Lord Jesus Christ gave you life. Doesn't matter if you want to believe that or accept that or not. That's a fact. That's the truth. You have life and it's been given to you by Jesus Christ. He is your creator. He is not your father by adoption. Because you have to go to him on his terms. And then he purchase you, purchases you with his blood. But he still made you. You're not going to get... You, it doesn't matter how many uh, seminars you go to, how many Discovery Channel documentaries about the, the retarded evolution theory religion. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whatever you want to believe. You're going to give an account to Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. He made you. He made you. He made you. He can send you to hell. And he will unless you come to him on his terms. And see, we in faith on our Lord Jesus Christ, having him within us, he moves us. He is the wind in the sails. He is the wind. And we act on that. Okay? And go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Uh, this, this is... This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Psalm 78. Have you figured out why we do it? Have you figured out why we do it yet? Psalm 78, verses 1 on verse 8. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Different dispensation. Again, instruction and in righteousness. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. <laughs> Today you try to go hand a gospel tract to a, to a child, you know. Um, number one, the thing about the age of accountability, yeah. But they, they call this hate speech. Give it to the parents. Give it to the parents. Like when you get the chance to go track a school or something, you know. That's, that's a good thing to do, okay? But yeah, children need to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. 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 But let's continue. We will not hide them from the child, their children. And how many Christian, uh, of Christianity in their little Sunday school, right? Yeah. You were saved in Sunday school. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. Showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. Uh, instruction and in righteousness, the wonderful works that he hath done. His death, burial, and resurrection. The blood he shed on the cross. 
Okay? For he established a testimony in Jacob. We are his testimony today. And appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. But what's happening nowadays? Give them a health phone. Give them a tablet. Set them in front of a television. Have the Jesuits train them. Instead of the father and mother. That they might set their hope in God. Not in man. And not forget the works of God. But keep his commandments. Showing what dispensation is for. But that they might set their hope in God. And you, you hand a child a tablet, a, a cell phone, health phone, set them in front of a TV to distract, send them off to a Jesuit-run school. Brad, are you against schools? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Because, of, oh boy, hey, you can share all kinds of things in school, like uh, pink eye, right, brother? <laughs> right? Yeah. Share all kinds of things. They teach, they teach kids evolution. They teach kids how to, to, to blur gender. I, why should a six-year-old be learning about sex, sexual intercourse? Why? Why? Why should a six-year-old be learning about how to confuse what a man and a woman is? That's devilish. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, the death, burial, and resurrection, okay? But, his, but keep his commandments. And might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. And, you know, we look in the Old Testament, all things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through, the, through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Okay? Go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. The, the devil-possessed man, who the Lord cast the devil out of. See, when the Lord saves you, when you come to the Lord on his terms, and he saves you, he seals you with himself. The love of Christ constraineth us. I want to share the Lord with you. If he saved me, he could save you. But he ain't going to do it at gunpoint. And you can't come to him. Well, hey, hey, hey I'm pretty good. I'm not that. Why wouldn't he want to save me anyway? Huh? I'm pretty good. I haven't done anything to nobody. You know, everything that's wrong, it's, it's someone else's fault. Hey, I'm, I'm just as a happy-go-lucky. I'm a catch, man. You're scum. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're scum. I'm scum. But it is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Unless you've been broken, you, you, you don't know what that's like. Oh, oh, you're broken because you lost your little things here in this world. This is life afflictions, boy. You gotta be eternally minded. But the devil possessed man. Cast the devil out of him. Look at this. Verses uh, Mark 5, 18 and 19. What are you doing? That Mark 5, verses 18 and 19. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, 
go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. Lord saved me. He can save you. Let me tell you about him. Let me, let me tell you about the true Jesus Christ. Here, take this. Consider this, okay? The love of Christ constraineth us. We want for you what the Lord did for us. But see, you're not going to be forced to do it, my friend. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Back there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 5 on to verse 12. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the capital S spirit, the Lord himself, and the Lord is that spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Home. Oh, don't come, don't come yet, Lord. There's still some good things to be done here. No, come on, Lord. Let's go. But see, he has a purpose for us staying here. Remember, who will the Lord save today who wasn't saved yesterday? For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present for, with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now, salvifically we are. Once saved, always saved. What is this talking about? Uh, are we saying that we know Christ, but in works we deny him? Hmm? Are we being conformed to this world, or are we being transformed by the renewing of our mind? Don't for one second... Let some of these heretics tell you that the way you live doesn't mean anything. It does. If you come to the Lord on his terms and you are truly saved, born again, converted, you're once saved, always saved. Yes. Yes, that's true. That's true. But the way you serve Christ reflects Christ. And man, you don't want to have the Lord. You don't want to be part of that big party and the host of the party wants nothing to do with you. But let you in there because he's a man of his word. Come on. For, and right here, brother, brother, sister, we know this, but you lost people. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, judgment seat of Christ is for us who are saved. You who are lost, Great white throne of judgment. See, we are going to be redeemed, resurrected, caught up. Okay, the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? The judgment seat of Christ is for the saved. And we all, so in context here, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In context, talking about those who are saved. Okay? You're lost. You're not going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. You're not. That's not how it works, okay? But the point is, we're going to give an account of ourselves at the judgment seat of Christ. And our rewards are going to be tried. Not for our salvation. For, for rewards in heaven. Okay? You lost people. You're going to give an account of yourself to God at the great white throne of judgment. And it's not looking good for you. It's not. Okay? That every one of us, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Okay, because he is a God of judgment. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You're going to give an account of yourself. Like it says here, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. <laughs> Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 
But we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. <laughs> For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance, not in heart. Them Christians in the buildings at their stupid little prayer stations, not praying with anybody, sitting there on their hell phones, having women there. Glory in appearance, the facade. They put they put on the suit and tie every Sunday. Gotta be in church every Sunday. Where are you sending people? Uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ through the scriptures. You're sending them to hell. Your little stupid church building. It's going to go full circle, Jack. It's going to go first full circle. You watch. For it before it's all said and done. It's going to go full circle. Okay. Of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is one of these videos where... However long it takes, it takes. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. We talked about that in the previous videos, about the burning there. What happens if you blow a chance that you ought to have taken? It doesn't cost you self ethically, but oh, it could cost you in other ways. And what's interesting about this is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is where Paul is talking about as a apostle, as a preacher, um, he had every right to live of the gospel, but chose not to. Okay? You can read that on your own time. And while we're here, go to verses 20 on to verse 22. And on to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law. Be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. Now, see, heretics will come to this and say, so see, we got to keep the law. No. No. Were you, were you here at the beginning, earlier parts of this video in uh, Galatians chapter 2? Verses 20, what, 21 and, 20, uh, 21 and 22, right? Uh, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain, okay? The law of Christ, okay? Okay, which Paul talks about in Romans chapter 13, okay? That I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. Was Paul doing this himself? Are you looking at that? I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Not that he's doing the saving, but that he's being the witness. He has made all things. He didn't like, okay, I'm going to personally choose to go to this demographic. Or I'm going to personally choose. Or I'm going to personally choose to not. I've run into this with these people who go just a little overboard about the kindred thing. Uh, who say, well, I, the Hamites don't want me to uh, witness to them because I'm of Japheth. Uh, I, are you serious? I've heard that. I've heard that. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> but you're just like, well. They don't want me there. And quite honest, I don't want to be there myself. Oh, shut up. Go sh oh, shut up. Go dive in your uh, pool full of money. You hypocrite. Charlatan. Yeah. What if the Lord... Hey, you're saved, church of the living God. What if the Lord, you're of Japheth, he wants you to go to a Hamite. You're a Hamite, saved, brother, sister of the church of the living God. What if he wants you to go to a Japhethite or a Hebrew? The Lord, when he first saved me, you know where he sent me to? 
Jews, Hebrews. They were the, the Hebraic people were among some of the first that the Lord had me to encounter and sent me to. Okay? That's just the way it worked. That's what he did. Why? I don't know. But see, we are made by who? He's the wind in the sail. He's the wind in the sail. He says, go that way. Don't go that way. I want you to go this way. It's not up to us, but it's up to him, remember? Okay? We are made, like Paul, I am made all things to all men. In whatever situation, whatever demographic he wants to send you to, he is the wind in the sail. We take action. We step out of that boat in faith. Faith. Okay? And 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We want verses 3 and 4, if my fingers will get there. <laughs> For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Hey, Calvinist. Hey, you chosen ones who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. All men. But not everybody is going to come to him on his terms. Way One way too many are booting the door out of the way and coming up some other way. But he will have all men to be saved. God doesn't want anyone to perish. But see, you got to be broken of yourself. See, people like to quote uh, Ezekiel chapter 18 to the blue in the face, but they always seem to go over, to skip over that repentance thing. Just like the easy believism uh, heretic. Okay? Look, you're going to be broken whether you uh, one way or another. And most of you devils, uh, by the time you get to the white, uh, great white throne of judgment, your breaking isn't going to mean anything to you. Because you're going to hell, the lake of fire. First Peter chapter three, one verse. Uh, what, what? Second Peter, excuse me. Second Peter chapter three. Sorry, one verse, verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. You you remember that, brother, sister, right? As some men count slackness. But is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, you lying devil, hypocrite, scoundrel, you have today. Now, some of you out there, you've made your choice, you're serving Satan knowingly, and you're there to just be a problem. You're going to hell. You can't be saved. Not that the Lord can't save you, but you've made your choice. There's no turning back for you. Um, majority of other of you, though, you have today. The Lord is showing long suffering uh, towards you. You have today. Is this the day that he may save you? Or is this the day that you're going to die and go to hell? Got to get over yourself there, sir. Okay? And of course, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 on to verse 16. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope. That is in you with meekness and fear. Apologetics people come to this and use this verse to say that we as who are saved ought to give an answer to every man on every occasion, on every thing. No. It says the hope. I've seen this. I've encountered this. They've quoted this. It's like it's talking about the hope. We're not supposed, I, I mean, there are some people who ask questions just to ask stupid questions. They don't want to hear the answer. You don't waste your time with that. Those are foolish questions, okay? Foolish. People who ask questions, who believe in their heart that there is, who say in their heart there is no God and act accordingly, okay? 
Yes, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Why are you doing this? Because Christ Jesus died for sinners, of whom I am chief. I deserve to go to hell. I put him on that cross. And until he saved me, I was going to hell. And you know what? I'm afraid. I was afraid of him. I am afraid. I fear the Lord. I'm going to stand before him and give an account for myself. So are you. That's why we do this. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as evildoers, that, ye, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Oh, brother, sister, there's some, there's some hope for us right there. All these people who called you a trouble, like our dear brother who went to the police station. He was a troublemaker, right? Oh, great white throne of judgment, brother. You know this because you get all this. You know this. Those ones who accused you, called you a troublemaker, who falsely accused you, you're going to see him. You're going to see him because we're going to be up there with the Lord Jesus. We're going to be up there. I'm going to see my mother when she goes before the great white throne of judgment. So are you with many of your lost relatives who died and are in hell. We're going to see them give an account of themselves at the great white throne of judgment. We're going to see it. We're going to be privy to it. Okay? And of course, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Which, again, the easy believism heretics. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 14 on to verse 17. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? An easy believism heretic focuses on believe. Go away. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Someone to be a witness? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the lowercase w, word of God, the scripture. See, verse 14 on verse 17 is talking about those who are sent. And we're all in the ministry of reconciliation. We're not all preachers. True. True. Yes. Amen. But we're all in the ministry of reconciliation. You have a calling to do something for the Lord. Where's your faith? Oh, ye of little faith. That's why we do what we do. Okay? 2 Corinthians 10, just one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Just one verse, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Like these people who say, well, you got to go to a Jesuit. They don't say that. You got to go to a cemetery school so you can get the credentials. And you have to have a, a thousand, a hundred thousand dollar piece of paper on your wall that says Jesuits. <coughs> excuse me. Man says I'm qualified to do this. I didn't take this upon myself. Are you crazy? No. This is what the Lord had me to do so that there'll be an equality. Thank you, by the way, for that, brother. So meet. Thank you. Okay? This is, this is what he has me to do. What does he have you to do? Shut! Shut! 
There's something. What is it? What is it? What is it? Find it. Probably not that hard to find, is it? Okay? And of course, you know, and this is what the church building people, they take it upon themselves. They, or, you know, themselves. They are the ones who are doing it. They're not driven. The wind that drives them is not the Lord. It's the flatulence of man. Okay? Hebrews chapter 5, just one verse. Verse 4. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. Okay? And we are the called if we come to him on his terms. And we're all in the ministry of reconciliation. You have a purpose. There is something for you to do. Why aren't you doing it? Okay? Of course, Amos chapter 7. Amos chapter 7. I like Amos. I like Amos. I like Amos. Amos chapter 7. Just two verses. Amos, which is, Amos is after the book of Joel. Amos chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet. Neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Simple man. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Go, do something. Why are we doing it? Faith. That's why we do what we do, dear friend. Okay? And 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Not 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Brad. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We want verses 6 and 7. I have planted. Paulus watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. The love of Christ constraineth us. In Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 14, Verses 21 and 22. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to, to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God there is not talking about the physical, literal kingdom of heaven. It's the spiritual. Okay? Like we addressed, I believe, in the first video, or in the previous video. When Peter got out of the boat, it, it, the wind was contrary and boisterous. When Peter stepped out, took action in faith, out of the boat, the conditions, like the one comment was, the conditions were not, you know... Much rather step out of the boat when it was a nice, clear, sunny day, the wind wasn't doing anything, and the sea was nice and calm. No, Peter stepped out of the boat in faith. He took action in faith, guided by the Lord, okay? His eyes focused. When did he step out? When the wind was contrary. The sea was, uh, was raging. The, the ship was tossed. That's when he got out of the boat. That's what that's talking about. Okay? There will be moments when witnessing will be smooth. Yes. Yes. When it's a simple. Can I, can I offer you a gospel track? Sure. Wait a minute. It's like, thank you. Have a good day. Okay? But other times, hey, what what'd you do to my car? I didn't do nothing to your car, man. You touched my, not one part of my body touched your car. I only put this on your windshield wiper. That's all I did. I didn't touch your car, man. Don't touch my car. I'm calling the cops. I didn't touch your car. But hey, don't worry. I'm out of here. Okay? 
you do what you will with that. Okay? Much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. We're, we're like we already read. We're assaulted every day with things of the world. That's why it's so beautiful to disconnect. Disconnect. For example, past couple of days, uh, the Lord has given me great sleep. Uh, sleeping with someone who has a heart problem is, comes rarely. But uh, past couple of days, he's given some incredible sleep. But I disconnect. Turn off the hell phone. Turn everything off. You know, set a time to go to bed. Lay down. Pray, Lord, can you give me a good night's sleep? For he gives his beloved sleep. But you know, you disconnect. You don't, you're not bombarded. You know, you have to have some times to disconnect. Because we're, we step outside our door, we see the women dressed like whores and men dressed like whores. We're bombarded with advertisements and uh, music. You go into a store and all oh, we're on every side. But yet we're not destroyed. Like, like we like we read in uh, where was that? Well, like we read in First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians, chapter four. There, go back there. Okay. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Of uh, Second Corinthians four, verses eight, uh, on to verse twelve. Okay, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Okay? For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Faith is the reason we do what we do. The Lord saved us. He can save you. We are led by his movement. We take action. And that action we take is in faith. Faith that what he proposes will be done. That is going to be it for this video. The whole point of these videos was to stir you to get off your duff and quit making excuses to get out there and do something for the Lord. The time is short. I was sent a video link about something that's going on in um, England, the UK. That's something about a cashless society, uh, smart money thing. So I got that to watch today. I was sent a link on that. But uh, the, the time is running out, people. You got Putin talking about a nuclear war. And our, apparently our government is buying anti-radiation stuff. Could be fear-mongering, yes. We have nothing to fear. But time is running out. The Titanic is sinking, brethren. Are you shoveling in the coal to keep the fire going as long as the Lord say? Or are you just sitting there? Thank you for those of you who help us, who pray for us. We love you. We love you so very much. The Lord recompense you with the sea. Okay? Thank you. We love you and we pray for so many of you. Yesterday, the Lord uh, and um, yesterday, 
I met a woman who is a crack addict. Uh, hopefully that woman may see one of these videos and post a comment and we go from there. Pray for this woman. I, I cannot say her name. I won't say her name because uh, I haven't got the permission to do so. But if, they, if, you're watching, if you watch this one, uh, woman that I, I ran into yesterday, leave a comment. There are emails. Go ahead and get a hold of me. So. Anyway, that's going to be it for this video. We love you. Thank you. Pray for one another, brethren. I'm going to get this uploaded. We love you, and we will see you in the next video.